Hi, it's Karen Webster, and welcome to our conversation today about how robots can fix identity verification. With me today to have that conversation is Sunil Madhu, the co-founder and CSO of Secure. Hey, Sunil, thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me, Karen. So nothing like robots to draw a crowd, I have to say. Um, the world is fascinated with robots. They seem to be everywhere. We have robots that flip burgers, do surgery, deliver pizza, very important, uh, greet guests in hotels in Japan, take orders at QSRs, and the, and the list goes on. Um, unfortunately, that's not the kind of robot we're talking about today, um, but, but it does make for great visuals. And, a, and I think an illustration of a concept, which is that robots do things that humans don't want to do or don't have the capacity for doing for a variety of reasons, and I think that's the application for robots today. Uh, we're going to get into what these robots have to do with identity verification, but, but the title, Sunil, of our discussion is Fixing Identity Verification and how robots can come to the rescue. Before we talk about what they're doing, let's talk about why we need them to fix it, what's broken. Sure, Karen. Um, the, the world we live in today has fundamentally changed. Um, if you look at the demographics in the U.S., for example, um, you've got um, a, a lot of millennials, young people, um, you know, and 80% uh, of the workforce in the next three years in the United States, uh, according to consumer reports, are millennials. Um, in the same time frame, in the next three years, 40% of the U.S. population are going to be Generation Z. Um, one common thing that we have between these two kind of um, uh, generations is the fact that uh, they're mobile first, instant gratification, and they've lived and grown up in this digital economy. The, the challenge is that the infrastructure that we've been relying on for the last 50 to 100 years, uh, which is fundamentally the credit bureau uh, infrastructure, the experience of the world, um, that infrastructure which has been used to risk create people based on this notion that we have to get into debt in order to prove ourselves as trustworthy, that doesn't cover this entire demographic. Um, not only does it not cover the demographic of millennials and Generation Z, you know, if you consider the fact that credit from a global perspective is only available in 14 countries, three of those countries don't use credit for cultural reasons because people look at credit as debt. Uh, Japan, Australia, and Germany as examples. But 180 countries in the world, large growing nations, um, don't have credit systems. And uh, people kind of live off cash, and cash is king in the world. So, you know, there's this notion that, you know, we've moved away from this offline, um, you know, data collection, static data, um, which are ultimately all stolen anyways. The last data breach that affected one of the largest bureaus affects all bureaus equally because they have overlap on the coverage of the population. And think about the fact that in financial services and so on, you've got anti-money laundering compliance regulation that mandates the use of data that's been stolen. It's, it's, it's crazy. You know, and then what? you've got this, you know, the, you've got the U.S. Patriot Act, right, in the United right. States. The U.S. Patriot Act says you've got to validate somebody's uh, name and social security number and date of birth, um, you know, and address. I could buy those attributes off the web for about $4 today because of the amount of stolen data out there. So you combine the fact that, you know, the, the credit-worthy people, those that are thick-file, um, their data has been stolen, and those that are thin-file, young people, uh, people living on cash, you know, they're, they're basically forced out of the system. The system actually causes financial exclusion. And so, you know, when we look at um, the future where identity is going to go, we know that um, identity has to be dynamic. Um, it can't be based on you know, static attributes that can be stolen. Identity is, after all, contextual. Um, and then you've got this notion of frictionless um, uh, user experience. So wherever I'm required to identify myself, um, you know, the, the user today wants that to be instant. They don't want to have to wait two days for some batch process to execute somewhere or turn up at some branch location with physical documents. You know, and the, the, the future of identity has to be free of bias. Um, you know, it's very important that a race, gender, and other types of attributes like age do not have unintended consequences when intermixed with 
different types of models. So the models that we create that identify us or identify a persona of us as trusted, well, um, that system must make sure it is, it is not uh, making decisions based on bias, and it must be explainable. So, Sunil, let, let me just interrupt here for a minute. I, I, I do want to mention to people listening, feel free to log questions throughout. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll pose them to Sunil. I, I wanted to mention that. I forgot to do that. But, but on the spectrum of, of the future, dynamic, frictionless, and free of bias, where is the most egregious gap today? I mean, I would think that um, there, are, there are laws that prevent you know, bias being built into, you know, zip code, name, gender, race already. Um, is that still one of the big hurdles that this needs to solve, or are there others that you think are more high or are higher in priority? So, so you know, you, you talk about the laws. Well, there's uh, FICRA, which is really the fundamental law in the United States, the Fair Credit Act, which basically uh, requires you to rely on non-self-reported data from credit bureaus in order, and you know, that basically track your indebtedness uh, history as a mechanism of using that for forecasting the future, which after the housing market crisis, everybody should be convinced that the FICO model just is, is bullshit, right? It, it can't predict for all possibilities in the future or for sudden changes in demographics, et cetera. Um, so those, those uh, regulations af affect compliance, regulatory compliance. Um, also for transparency, um, you know, you're required to do something called model governance. You, so you're required by certain regulations to ensure that the models are, are kind of transparent and not having undeterministic effects. So mm -hmm. um, I would say that, you know, when you ask the question, well, which of these are, are, are the most painful? Well, for us right now, it's the public's dumb because all three are painful and all three are happening right now. All the static data we rely upon has been stolen. So you can't trust that anymore. Um, you know, because of the fact that the, the coverage of the bureau doesn't match the growth of thin file people. Um, you now have this emerging demographic driving top line revenue of every business. You know, every business needs to sign up new customers, right? Well, th th if, they, if they're going to end up relying on a system that rejects 50% of those people knocking on their door, there's a problem there. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you, you know, the, the, the notion that you, because you're creating automated models, the models must be free of bias, yeah, sure, that notion is well understood. Uh, both in regulation and in the field of data science. So, so, so the, a question, I, I'm pretty sure you're going to get to this later, Sunil, but it's, it's when using AI, um, and, and in this instance, the, the, the parenthetical is neural networks. Um, can you be confident that bias like age, race, gender isn't creeping into the models over time? Will you be getting to that later, or, or do you want to comment on that now? Yeah, I'll, I'll comment a wee bit about it, but I'll talk about it more uh, later. Um, you know, one thing's for sure, um, if you take a racist human being and you try to uh, train racism out of them, you'll find that that doesn't work. Uh, human beings can't be uh, untrained from their biases, which are 99% subconscious or most of the time. Um, you know, they can't, they can't be untrained. A machine that is supervised, that's learning constantly uh, from data being fed into it, can be you know, if, if we identify, for example, a bias in that machine or the model, new models can be deployed. Larger training samples can be supplied that eliminate the bias in the system. A classic example today is, uh, you know, a lot of facial recognition systems have trouble uh, basically uh, differentiating between uh, people who are not white. Um, and that's fundamentally because the training sets used to train these, these uh, machine learning algorithms for computer vision everywhere have been pr predominantly white people. So you now supply non-white spaces into the system, the system will learn. You can't do that with human beings. So I'll get into that uh, a, a bit later. Now, the main difference as to why we're a proponent of the machines versus the human is because the human being takes a lot of time. They're inefficient from that perspective. Um, you know, the, the accuracy is limited. Just to work with uh, model building, each type of algorithm you're testing, et cetera, might take weeks. Um, and then, you, you, you got your biases creeping in, as you commented, you know, judgment. We live in a subjective universe. We try to use ontological objectivity, but it doesn't work all the time. And then the amount of work, volume of work, um, you know, human beings suck at going across, you know, thousands of different types of data simultaneously to find out correlations and, and causality behind them. Um, you know, so 
machines don't have these problems. Machines can uh, do the job looking at large, vast amounts of data from data lakes, uh, often data that doesn't look like they're connected, um, you know, and find out the uh, data, the features that matter from that data, and then produce more accurate results, meaning less friction, um, unbiased results, uh, provable results, and it can do that at scale that humans just cannot. And therefore, you get, you know, top line improvement, revenue improvement in your business, and bottom line cost reduction. So it's a, it's a win win. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. So, talk about the evolution, because I think there are some questions that I have on, on this as well, but let me, let me have you go through this first. Sure, Karen. So, you know, if you kind of look at um, how the tools we've been using have, have evolved over time, we've started with uh, credit bureaus and their models. Uh, the oldest bureau is 108 years old. Uh, the youngest one is, you know, like 20, 30 years old. But their business model is collecting data, un, you know, self-reported data, as they, they call it, um, it, you know, and then using that data for equivalence tests. So, you know, where the credit bureau was doing a pure equality test in the past and fuzzy matching, and they have now rules engines. So that where we've gone in the last 50 years is essentially this world of rules. If you look at uh, the largest bureaus and their futuristic platforms, um, and I won't name them, but you know, all of their futuristic platforms are essentially um, the same. They're a rules engine that allows the buyer to select various different types of data sources, point solution vendors, um, whose outputs can then be uh, fed into some human-defined rules, um, and then those rules executed. That entire process that these bureaus, the, this legacy infrastructure facilitates, is rife with problems. So first off, you know, in a rules-based system, rules are created based on human intuition. They're limited by them. Um, after about 2,000 rules in the, in the rule base, for example, even if you use machine learning and rule induction, you'll still have problems figuring out the waterfall effects of making a rule change. Um, what if I delete rule number 1,075? What's the effect of that on the overall integrity of the system? It's very hard often to answer those type of questions. Um, and then rules are reactive. So that means that, you know, you, let's say you create a rule that says opening up 10 accounts a day is a sign of fraud. Um, that if a fraudster knows that such a rule exists, they're just going to open up one account a day for 10 days and bypass your rule. And then you've got to go and change the rule base again. So this uh, idea that enterprises and businesses generally know which right combination of vendors to check off and intermix and what rules to create and how to update those rules over time, this is the ancient way of doing stuff. This is the stuff that keeps 50% of your uh, you know, new business away from your revenue recognition. Right, so um, we, we've kind of started on the right-hand side of this uh, equation from day one. Um, we felt that machines could combine um, lots of different types of data, digital online data, because the internet's 25 years old, we all use mobile applications, we all have digital exhaust. We create connections with other people in the real world, those connections show up online in social networks. You know, there's all these different types of data, structured and unstructured, that we can combine with the traditional offline data to construct newer behaviors and from those discern whether a person's identity um, is real or synthetic or, or you know, stolen and fake. Um, and we can make much more accurate decisions, which at the end of the day, from a business perspective, means that your business can sign up customers really rapidly um, without um, you know, the, the, the second day treatment or without going through outdated step up technology like uh, KBA, knowledge based authentication. Uh, which in, the internet has pretty much defeated, or even you know documentary verification, which is all the rage these days. Uh, can I use my passport and driver's license? Well, document verification should be typically the last stop, the backstop to manual review, because it's a crappy user experience. If the user can just come in on a click, presenting a, a basic identifier that allows the application to authenticate the individual and know there's trust in that uh, in the in the identity element and authorize the individual and personalize the application, that is what you're ultimately looking for. Um, and so we believe that machines can do a much better job. And where we are right now and what we've been doing for the last six years internally, we're going to end up exposing to the world, which is the, the first artificially intelligent identity verification agent. We've named it ADA. Um, and ADA is a sum of six years worth of research and development 
Um, it is a, a single purpose um, uh, AI, meaning it's an expert system. It is not con uh, conscious yet. <laughs> uh, it is an expert system and it understands a lot about what it means to be a real person versus a risky identity um, online and in the real world. Um, and it's been learning over the last six years with a lot of data fed to it from some of the largest institutions that we power, which include, you know, the, the top banks and uh, payments companies and lenders and remittance companies and so on. Um, and so what, what we do, just, you know, yeah, it, yeah. Just, 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 just a quick question to, to go back and clarify, because, you know, we use these words sometimes often interchangeably, AI, machine learning, neural networks, deep learning. What's the, what are the nuances and the differences as you see it and as digital identity verification has evolved, what do your what does your robot do? Does it incorporate all of those things? Some of those things? How would you how would you answer that question? Sure. Um, you know, for everybody on the on the call, um, I don't have a diagram to illustrate this, but I'm sure you can understand what I'm about to describe. So if you were to follow Venn, di Venn diagrams and sort of um, um, draw a Venn diagram, which is basically a large circle that represents some set of something. The outermost circle is AI, meaning AI is a collection of a lot of systems and methods and tools um, that allow us to make decisions like human beings would with machines. Um, and, you know, we, we call them artificially intelligent uh, because they're not 100% uh, intelligent or sentient like human beings. And the furthest we've come in the 80s, the very first AI boom uh, with Lisp machines and uh, Ada back then as a lab prologue. Uh, with those type of machines, um, you know, that was when we were seeing the nascent early birth of uh, expert systems, and now those expert systems are much more massive, much faster to train, et cetera. Um, machine learning um, is a subset of AI, so it's a circle inside the larger circle, um, and it refers to the types of tools uh, a mathematician, a statistician, a computational mathematics, uh, you know, graduate can actually use at their disposal in order to analyze data for, for classification, clustering, and other um, inferencing and other types of purposes. Um, and so it contains a bag of a variety of different tools. There are tools that try to solve uh, problems that are linear, meaning if you were to take the data and you were to plot a, a graph or a chart of it with an X, Y axis, uh, you'd see the data sort of follow some pattern where a bisecting line can be used to subdivide the data into different groups, or multiple lines of planes could subdivide the data in multiple dimensions. Um, and those are kind of for linear problems. And then you've got problems that are not linear, where you can't use a simple line or a simple plane. And those fall into the tools um, that we classify as artificial neural networks. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a fact of mathematics that you could take often a problem that is nonlinear, and simply by increasing the number of dimensions of data in that problem, you can attempt to make that nonlinear problem a linear problem. Um, the, the challenge in the past has been that we didn't have compute and we didn't have uh, the ability to use GPUs to train machines in minutes um, as a mechanism of accelerating that learning. Now we live in a time where we have ASICs um, and GPU acceleration for training very large layered neural networks, deep networks, with a variety of neural parallelized algorithms that allow us uh, to solve uh, in part for the dimensionality problem. Um, without a lot of dimensionality reduction often. So, you know, that's kind of the, the, the change. Um, uh, the, the, the smallest circle then inside the uh, ML circle, the innermost circle, that's uh, what we refer to as deep learning or neural networks, uh, which are a specific category of machine learning and they're not a panacea. They're good at certain types of pattern recognition. So great uh, at natural language processing, speech synthesis and processing, um, they're great at computer vision, uh, et cetera. So there are specific applications for those type of tools and they're not like a tool for everybody. Um, the challenge is that those tools are pretty much cutting edge and while we understand how we've designed neural networks and the algorithms um, that sort of operate on them, um, the, the challenge is explaining what happens internally in a neural network as the neurons learn and connect together like a virtual synapse to give you the final decision. Um, so, you know, that, there's more research in that space going ongoing, so eventually I expect that we will be able to do it. In the meantime, because of that 
you know, turning the nonlinear problem into a linear problem, uh, a digression earlier, um, you are able to run today in, and train um, systems that are uh, artificially intelligent uh, through neural networks, artificially int intelligent through, you know, computational mathematics, machine learning tools, linear modeling simultaneously. And you're able to look for convergence of the two models, meaning both different approaches to the problem converged on the same outcome with some degree of accuracy or confidence. And that means that you can use the linear model uh, features to explain the neural network. So that's where we are today. And, and I hope people understand. AI is a, is a term that everybody throws around uh, yeah. because it is just the largest uh, amalgamation of tools and techniques. And as you go into deep learning, you're basically narrowing down the scope of the problem. Got it. Th th thanks for the clarification, Sunil. I think it's helpful to just establish the connection or the connections yet to be made. So let's go back to now the robots to the rescue. Source wide sure. data. So, yeah, so you know, there are different parts of uh, kind of data science that you have to go through um, in order to process data. So the, the first thing is we need um, the ability to combine uh, offline and digital data. So there are a variety of different types of uh, digital data available uh, about us online, and the types of networks we are part of, uh, the way we pay, which is public on services like Venmo. You know, there are lots of behavior, behavioral data that is available both in the private and public domain. Um, the next part of the problem is that when you go and uh, integrate this data in real time, um, and ideally you're not doing things like screen scraping because of CFAA regulations and so on that might influence the, the specific industry, but you know, when you end up grabbing all of these different types of consensus data, you're then going to look at correlation patterns between, between them. So for example, from an identity perspective, I might have a Twitter profile with an alias called Batman. I'm not Batman, but um, you know, I might have that profile. Um, and then uh, that profile seems to share my photograph and my um, hometown and geolocation information or whatever with another profile in LinkedIn where my name is Sunil Madhu. So one could infer perhaps that those two profiles belong to the same individual and uh, if Batman happens to be an alias in this case for some persona of Sunil Madhu on that uh, site. Um, so you know, we take into account that privacy is a right of people. People should have the ability to redact information. And so we've engineered for scarcity of data, not massive availability of data. So our, our challenge is how do you take sparse profiles uh, from uh, different sources and interconnect them to say that, yep, yeah, this persona in the real world, this Sunil with his phone number and email address or whatever, correlates to this digital persona and that digital persona um, is real because it's connected to a lot of other people. It has a lot of uh, digital exhaust and behaviors that correlate strongly to a real human being. So that's, that's what the machine has to do in that step. And you know, often sort of creating a single score, uh, it just doesn't hold out. And then you have to make sure that the view you're creating is holistic. Like I said, if you're privacy centric, you have to accept the fact that uh, people may use aliases or maybe anonymous, right? And they have the rights to that. So the challenge is, well, how do you connect sometimes anonymous profiles? How do you connect, uh, you know, de-anonymizing profiles is very difficult, obviously, but how do you connect like sparse profiles uh, together to get a whole view on that individual um, that says that that identity is real and trustworthy? So that's the, the processing, the depth of processing in real time that the machine has to do, typically in under a second. Um, so, so if you can have, sorry, go ahead. So let me, let me ask you a question, because I, I want to go back to you said scarcity of data is what the model is programmed for, yet you need live data that you're sourcing. How, how do you know the sources of data can be trusted? Because um, you, you talk a lot about the fact that there's a bunch of junky data out there. Sure, good question. Well, um, because we, you know, as our business specifically sells to banks and whose you know, um, compliance requirements are pretty stringent, we are required to certify every single data source we include in our models down to fourth party mm -hmm. certification, meaning we audit them um, mm -hmm. if necessary physically on site. Um, so, you know, um, that's one way. Um, the other way is to get attestation from each of these data sources that the data is consented and it's not being scraped or stolen or whatever. So we, we follow rigor in the way we uh, use data. We also use search crawlers, um, you know, and what the, the search crawlers do is they kind of act as 
meta engines that end up sitting on top of different types of uh, people search engines and, and, and so on. Um, so, you know, we, we ingest data from data aggregators, these crawlers, the, uh, from uh, data brokers. Um, and so we, we have a corpus of all of this pool, if you will, data lake of public uh, uh, and private data, private data meaning data about uh, customers who are trying to do business or trying to open up an account or performing a transaction. That's passed in by our business customers. Um, all of that data is encrypted and stored in silos with different encryption keys and, and so on to, to satisfy security muster uh, to make sure the data is completely useless if the, the system is uh, attacked or when the system is breached. Um, that's kind of the paradigm we operate under. And we also have the ability of not storing any data at all. Um, so in addition to all of this data, um, or no data, we are uh, fed labels, meaning outcomes of actual decision making by human beings and automated systems that are part of the top financial institutions and e-commerce companies and uh, lenders and uh, you know logistics companies and insurance companies and so on. So there's a variety of different types of, of data about citizens. Um, and decision outcomes of all of these businesses, which, you know, from a collective intelligence perspective, the machine learns across these mm -hmm. silos of information. And the machine's able to then piece together little shards of identity and feedback over time to say that, yep, there's trust in this identity. There's absolute trust. In fact, you know, multiple large banks and financial institutions back this identity. And this identity historically has not caused any uh, fraud or any other kind of risk. So we use hmm. that type of, you know, rigor um, in, in at least what we build. That may not be required in every use case, but in our use case it certainly is. So, so, so the bank is the source of truth? Well, not just banks, but in essence, you know, large enterprises that consumers uh, interact mm -hmm. with. Um, the, 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 the issue generally with identity is that, you know, everybody keeps a silo of identity. And they don't keep a silo because, you know, self-sovereign identity is not possible. We all are the source of our own uh, system of record or truth. So I would argue self-sovereign identity already exists in who we are. The thing is that we have to disseminate information because it's not just sufficient to allow, uh, to, to just uh, to identify yourself as who you are to a machine or application. It's important not only to identify who you are, but what you are. Because the, who you are is used to start uh, a session with the user the what you are is used to authorize the user to personalize the experience. Simple example, if you log into a website with your Facebook ID, the website asks you uh, that, you know, it knows that who you are from your Facebook profile, obviously, but it asks you for permission about um, your personal profile details, which you can or cannot grant. Um, it does that because the application may want to, for example, say a welcome back Karen message. Now, if the application had to display a welcome back message to you, um, it would need to know that your name is Karen, and the system would need to pass the raw value of Karen into that application. So this, this you know, confusion around um, the types of data that need to be disseminated, well, unfortunately, because of the way applications work, every uh, data source will have different views on who you are. So we mm -hmm. aggregate that, right? Got it. Got it. Yeah, I mean, I was going to ask you, you know, your identity evolves, and it's your, your different your identity is different based on the the site or the source you're interacting with. It's stitching all that together to get the complete profile that you're that you're doing. That, that's yes? correct. It has to be. You yes. know, that's exactly right. And the the techniques and the algorithms we use, and the whole notion of machine learning, is not complete to predict uh, the same instance of some previously seen pattern you know, with positive or negative consequences in the future. That's not the purpose of machine learning. Uh, that's not there, 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 there are a couple questions I want to get to. I know we've got the brains in the machine to go, but this is an interesting one. So you, you mentioned that you don't store data. You source it, analyze it, and then take an action. Do you delete data once you've done that? What's what's the whole yeah, thing? So that's, yeah. I didn't say we don't store data. We have the ability to operate with storing data and without storing data. And it, it really comes down to the customer's preference. And, you know, there are certain handicaps for one versus the other. Um, by storing data, we're able to make sure that the system is robust constantly and it's able to make future predictions. Um, mm -hmm. To your, answer your question, you know, not just protect you from the stuff you've faced in the past, 
or other companies like yours has faced last week, but to actually see a newer pattern and say, hang on, this pattern is a good pattern or a bad pattern, a risky pattern, right? Um, so in order to do that, we need historical information, and so we routinely store uh, uh, encrypted data. Um, there are, you know, for compliance regulation, for example, for GDPR in the European Union, uh, you might not be allowed to store data. Um, so we right. end up taking the consent of data, processing it, deriving the knowledge, you know, out of the information that comes from the data, and then producing the outcome and storing that, but we wouldn't store any personal information in that modality. So there are different kind of challenges and different strategies one might use in both of these uh, techniques, and it's definitely hard when you're starting off and you have no data, but we're yeah. a six-year-old company and we have a lot of data. Got it. Okay. Let's go on to the robots, because this is what the whole thing is about, the robots. Right. So, you know, if you peel the onion skin back and you say, well, okay, uh, it makes sense, you know, machines can do a better job at this than humans can and probably more cost-effectively. Um, well, how, how does the machine actually work? So, you know, what we do is we take the intrinsics in data science, which is ingesting data. A lot of uh, time is spent in data science in data engineering, so uh, figuring out what data is useful, what is not in the data, what features are useful or can be derived uh, through combining different types of attributes or, or, or subtracting them, for example. So this is very time consuming. We've uh, automated all of that. The bot does that. Uh, automatically. And then, you know, like I said, you know, taking the data and then generating uh, features out of the data that can be applied to models that might provide lift. Uh, this is a, a big problem too. Um, you know, I say often that you could have access to the same data sources that I, I do, but if your features uh, from that data are more effective than my features from that data, your models will always outperform mine. That's a mm -hmm. fact. So extracting the right features, throwing away the useless features, et cetera, these are um, time consuming. We've got a, a bot that takes care of that. Um, the aspect of training, so you got your features, now you need labels. You need outcomes to which you're, uh, you know, you're trying to optimize for. So for example, in the world of identity, you'll have three parts to a triangle. There's um, authenticity, you know, uh, fraud prevention, um, and there's uh, manual review. So there's fraud, acceptance, and manual review are three different sides of the same triangle. Um, typically, human beings can try to optimize for any two sides. Um, if I let more people into my company, there'll be more fraud, which means I'll, I'll have to have more people in manual review because my automated system isn't effective. Or maybe my internal fraud rate is at 30 basis points. It's low enough that making it 25 basis points is not going to give me any more advantage. Well, I want to keep my fraud at 30 basis points, but at 30 basis points, I'm rejecting eight good people for every one bad person I'm, I'm taking in, which causes me to have 6,000 people in manual review to fix the situation. Um, well, I want to reduce that 6,000 to 2,000, and I want to reject fewer people. Well, these are optimization goals. So we get different types of data for different optimization goals, for reducing fraud, for increasing acceptance, meaning discerning between good and bad people, um, and then um, to reduce manual review. If a transaction were to go into a human review team who fire up their browsers and go to Facebook and LinkedIn and check out if the person happens to be legit, well, we're automating all of that. So we get outcomes from manual review at scale, and we train models, and so our models can say, well, you know, if, we, if you use this model, you don't need to use uh, those 6,000 people anymore because the computer knows that if the transaction were to go into manual review, the outcome is going to be accept or decline. And so that you can get rid of you know, friction-filled technology like KBA, knowledge-based authentication. You know, bureaus like to sell that stuff all the time. Um, ideology does it, experience does it. Those tools are you know, completely uh, rendered useless today for the amount of stolen data. We can avoid those, the use of those tools and the friction that comes with them. Is, is, this, where, is this where you get to um, assessing um, the, the, the output. So I don't know how to quite articulate this question, but how do you trust the model? So let's say there's, you know, there's an output that is so different than what you've seen before or have experienced before that it causes you to question the model, even though the output may be correct. It's just very different. 
is this where that process gets refined? So that gets refined in the, in the comply step. So the first step okay. is to go create the models. And there's a bit of a definition there in the, in the process generally in that, you know, certain types of attributes uh, shouldn't be used. Uh, you know, it's a misnomer that a system might be racist because there's a column in data called race. A system could be racist just because the zip code uh, in which the data was sampled, the stratified random sample of data used to train the system, came with a concentration of a certain demographic living in a particular zip code that had mm -hmm. the same features, which might give a propensity for the system to be biased to or for that race in that zip code. So there are all of these different ways that biases can creep in directly or indirectly. And the, the answer is not to simply exclude data just because you're afraid that, you know, if you put that column in, there will be bad outcomes. You can, you can get bad outcomes just by putting garbage into the system. So, you know, we go through a process um, that ends up, first off, you know, combining different types of data. And then that, that model goes through integration testing. Um, and this is where we end up checking the model's integrity what happens if we drop this column? What happens if this piece of data is not available in one time? How does the model behave? Um, you know, and then we go through model governance. This is where we make sure with test data sets that um, if we end up passing this data in, the outcome is going to be deterministic. It's going to be positive or negative in a deterministic way. Um, this is where we look at the different algorithms and document them, and we look at the combination of algorithms and the ensemble as we call it, and, and, you know, we look at the types of features that are actually causing the, the ensemble to move one way or the other. Um, this is where we go through that rigor. And there's doc the, the robot automatically produces documentation for us that allows any auditor today to be able to look at it and say, yep, okay, this satisfies our risk management controls. Um, and then we deploy the, the, the productionize the model um, and we monitor the performance of the model in real time. Every uh, model has a degradation curve over time um, with linear modeling systems, especially if the features are time dependent. Um, age of an account is a good example. A young account might be more risky, but wait a year, it'll be less risky. So we look at these type of degradation curves for models, um, and we uh, anticipate when the model is gonna have to be redeployed or retrained. Um, and so today the system basically alerts our data science team um, of variances, but where this robot is tending towards is that it does that by itself, that it knows that uh, this is the baseline humming frequency of the system. This little thing is, is a noisy, spiky outlier. It doesn't mean anything significant, but this other thing is significant. And uh, to be able to take the action of simply ingesting the next most recent uh, batch feed of data uh, to retrain itself. Um, so, you know, this, this is really data science. Typically in most companies, you may have hundreds of people in each of these different functions or across mm -hmm. those functions. Um, we've gotten rid of all of those people um, and we've built an AI that does this. So it, the AI can generate hundreds of models per hour by itself. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, we're calling this AI ADA. I'm, I'm just gonna, the next few slides, I'm sort of go, gonna go into uh, what ADA does, uh, what it, ADA is all about. Um, so in essence, all of these different types of uh, steps in that little iteration there that I went through is already managed by uh, ADA. ADA sources data from a variety of different types of data sources. Um, ADA allows us to uh, determine newer data sources that might give us better efficacy um, and allows us to swap out data sources over time or combine data sources for effectiveness. Um, it drives uh, behavior from static data. So for example, if someone were to provide a phone number, we are able to look at uh, dimensions such as, you know, what was the porting history of that number? Or is that number's phone uh, book address correct, um, you know, correlated with the individual's actual current address from a different data source? So it does, it knows the different dimensions in which uh, we operate with identity. And we look at both, uh, you know, kind of offline and online data we are also able to process digital to physical ID. So we also process physical documentation like passports and driver's licenses and state or government issued ID, not just digital ID. Um, it takes all of that corpus of information. It then um, combines all of this dynamic data that's connected to it and expands on the sparse corpus of input to create a much larger corpus of features 
behind the scenes, which are abstract from the data provider, meaning no data vendor's data or uh, passes through our system transparently uh, ever. Mm. Um, and then we basically uh, create risk scores which are explainable. So we're able to tell people that, and it's not just one score. So you know, we're, we're able to say that this should be an accept decision. You should also accept this person between you know, 0 0.01 and 0 0.25, for example, and I'm just making those numbers up right now. But um, you know, you can, if the person scores between those thresholds for accuracy and correlation and risk, um, you know, you should accept that person. Uh, if it falls between these other thresholds, you should uh, reject that individual. There's no point doing step up and stuff. You're going to get uh, risk at the end of it, but very high accuracy, mind you, right? Now, uh, up to 95% so far. Um, and then, you know, uh, we're able to uh, say, well, you know, this particular identity has insufficient information about it, and it, it requires additional action. And if that action uh, needs to be step up to document verification, we're able to do that. So we're able to support the uh, the step up to ask the consumer to provide some uh, government or national ID as the last step to prevent manual review. And you know. As a result um, of this, ADA allows us to reduce bias and increase accuracy, and sort of you know deliver uh, these uh, kind of decisions very rapidly. So uh, you know, applicants can be rapidly uh, onboarded by our businesses without friction. So most of our customers see very uh, fast top line revenue growth and cost reduction. So, so, so Sunil, a, a couple questions that that kind of go back to when I asked earlier, and that is, how do you know if the data has been influenced by a bias from another organization, therefore you're introducing bias into your model without really knowing it. What do you, what do, you so, do to to, to, to there are different types of There are different types of mathematical approaches uh, for that. Um, you know, distance algorithms uh, and clustering can actually tell you whether um, you know, you've got biases creeping into your data. There are also sample, you know, random samples of data that you can apply to the system. So for example, let's say that you supply the system only data about immigrants, right? Non-white immigrants. Um, does the system reject th that population with a very high confidence rate at very large ratios? Well, clearly if it does that, there's a bias in the system somewhere. Um, so, you know, there are different ways of evaluating both by testing with different types of data samples. Um, you, you, you have this notion of holdout sets uh, in training. You know, you, you take uh, a large uh, sample of data, you train with, say, 70% of it, and you keep 30% out of the eyes of the, 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 the computer system, and then you replay that 30% for which you already know the right answers because it's historical data. And if you see that the system is tending some, in some other direction, then you know the model is imperfect. It's, it, it's not uh, effective. So there, there are statistical and computational mathematics techniques to actually help you, um, you know, reduce bias. Um, an algorithm, for example, I can name is uh, K-means. It's a well-known one. Um, anyways, you know, so, so we, we ensure that these uh, models um, fit the financial institution's model governance requirements. Otherwise, uh, these models would not be applicable in, in, the, uh, in the domain that we sell to. So, so the, I guess the other question it relates to this, um, this particular slide. So the use case here is payments or account opening or what is, the, what is the use case, the use cases I should say? So the most common use case is new account opening. Um, mm -hmm. It's not nice for your business to reject 50% of people trying to sign up. It's very bad for your business. Right. Um, you know, so that's a common use case and, and that means you're adding new lifetime value to your business without friction. Uh, top line revenue growth. And so on average, we get 30 to 60% incremental growth over what you're able to do today, meaning the acceptance rates are between 80 to 95% on average. Mm -hmm. um, we are able to cut, you know, your fraud, as, as one of our customers called it. Uh, I didn't realize that when we added, uh, I didn't, um, I didn't um, think about it, but like, um, you know, when we added your system, fraud just fell off a cliff. They never expected that to happen. They'd never seen that with any other system before. Um, and, you know, we are easily able to deliver ROIs in excess of 10 times the investment, easily. Um, and then we're able to allow people to streamline the, the process. You don't 
have to do a lot of manual work today to do things like uh, KYC compliance, um, you know, for uh, knowing your customer and so on, or for your risk processes, um, because all of that is provided for justifications provided by the automated system for you in a format and with accuracy and coverage and so on that passes the compliance musters of the largest financial institutions in the world. So, you know, you're not going to have any, any problems about oh, if I use this, what's the risk that's going to get, wrong, get it wrong and I'm going to get stuck with uh, libel. Um, you know, we operate in a very um, kind of regulated industry. So, you know, some, some other kind of comparisons for you. You should, after you see this, I'd be surprised if you don't rip out Xperia. Um, you know, and I, I bring Xperia because they're the largest of the, of the guys, or rip out ideology. Uh, because, you know, this is the difference. So, false positives, night and day, we're 10 times more accurate than the future solutions from those vendors in the market today. Um, we are, and we're getting better. <laughs> um, you know, we have the lowest uh, fraud rates. That is, we are, our capture rate is unmatched in the industry, not by any point solution vendor or stack vendor in the market you can pick, because we've been tested against all of them in challenger champion tests across large institutions. Our auto approval rates, Again, night and day, um, we're able to approve 95% of the people that come to your door, meaning your ad dollars for marketing and others are converting better. And we're able to eliminate the amount of work you have to do to justify everything and to be compliant with the regulations and with the auditors. You know, why wouldn't you buy this solution is the question I would ask the audience. And many of our customers ask the same question and they buy the solution. So, you know, I'm not trying to make it too much of a sales pitch here, but the, the system that we've developed has taken a lot of time and it is, it's very complex, but the interfaces to it, the way you can use uh, it is very simple. Um, it takes less than an hour for the largest, the smallest customers to integrate this type of solution. It's interfaces, it speaks JSON, not English today. Um, and, you know, you can just simply plug into it, into business processes for web applications or mobile applications or hybrid applications, um, and you will get your return pretty much immediately. Um, if you see some of the press releases in the, in the market, it'll give you an idea that, you know, if you bring this type of automation, you get a lot of benefit. It, you'll see a lot of very fast-going fintechs uh, have raved about us because we've been behind their growth, growing 1,200% year over year, um, because the, the problem is that acute. You've got all of these people in the market that are having uh, a problem of being accepted, and that problem um, affects multiple industries, you know, healthcare, telecom, federal and state government. Um, it affects financial services, e-commerce. Uh, name it, it affects it, because who we are is core to a lot of businesses. And then you can look at that problem globally at the five billion people who have mobile phones and who are online. And you can say, well, how large is this problem? So, you know, we believe that we are actually making a, a genuine uh, impact on the world. So, so, so a, a couple questions that have come in, and Sunil, you, you really are, you really are passionate about about this, um, and and that that obviously comes comes through. It says the, the question is about facial biometrics. Um, the the focus on biometrics, yes. No, at, at some point in the future, not relevant. What's, what's your position on that? Um, my position is that the combination of strong identity, meaning verified identity, and multi-factor authentication, which is simply the binding of that trusted identity to a device and then to a biometric, um, is the ultimate um, solution for the entire life cycle of the customer, from the day you sign the customer up to the, the customer performing the transactions on an everyday basis. Unfortunately, for lack of the type of tooling and mass adoption of mobile devices and such that had biometric sensors in them that were easy to use in the past, um, you know, we, we had to resort to uh, tens of different types of uh, probabilistic tools, tools that try to guess based on your you know, click pattern or how you buy or how you spend money or the type of devices you use or which geolocation you come from, et cetera. You know, um, but try to guess at whether this person is legit. Um, if today, um, if you have a, a doubt that a person who's been verified is legit at the time of transaction, 
you're able to use a free toolkit from Apple or uh, Xiaomi or Samsung or you know, Google, um, which exposes the underlying um, capabilities um, for biometrics in a, in a black box way. And you can say, hey, I'm not sure about this individual. Hey, Apple, uh, iPhone, go ahead and verify this person for me. And Apple's toolkit, the Swift library that you dropped into your, into your app, will do the job for you. You don't have to worry about how it does it. And it'll tell you, yep, it's Sunil. That's a legitimate user. So, you know, the step up authentication to do facial recognition or fingerprint sensing, et cetera, um, and the, the notion of always on authentication, these are things I think that will survive, um, whereas all of the rest of those technologies are going to contract. There are a lot of questions that have come in throughout the discussion, Sunil, about, about compliance and, you know, bias in, in models, which, which you've addressed. But this one in particular is about making it clear to regulators that this is, in fact, um, a legitimate model. It does not introduce bias, does not propagate bias particularly given the complexity of, of the model um, and how to, how to explain it. How, what, is, what has been your experience in talking to regulators about what you're doing? So first off, we anticipated this problem selling into financial institutions. Um, and so we built for it. We have over 2,000 explanatory variables in the system today that are accepted by compliance officers at the largest banks in the world. Um, so, you know, we have to pass the audit muster and the compliance muster off the financial institutions before they use the technology. So you can get some faith in the process that these institutions have run us through the ringer already and continue to. We are also compliant because we have SOC 2 Type 2 uh, compliance um, across all five pillars. We are uh, ISO 27001 and two other security ISOs, which you can see listed on our website, are compliant. Um, so, you know, we we do everything very transparently and by the rigor required by the institutions. Um, so the institutions adopt. Now, the difference in compliance in the U.S. versus, say, Europe is that Europe is forward-leaning from a compliance perspective. The government says, hey, GDPR is a new regulation, a new law. You guys have to use it. All 27 countries, you know, no exceptions. Um, and it's there for the better, better, betterment of society because it gives you control over privacy. Um, you know, America, by co contrast, is the exact opposite. We believe that uh, regulation stifles innovation. Uh, at least that's the, the um, kind of uh, the thing people have preached in the past. Um, and so, you know, first of all, there's a dichotomy. And in America, we're, we're required to prove out the efficacy of the solution and prove out that the solution fits within the regula regulator's frameworks by virtue of adoption. And so, you know, you have now the largest banks in the world, the largest remittance companies in the world, the largest e-commerce company in the world, lenders of uh, first and last resort to consumers and businesses, payment processors, core banking institutions using us as the provider of trust. Um, you know, we power also integration platforms, some of the, the common fraud engines in the market. Um, this is the newer, newer types of decision engines are our partners. Um, you know, human workforce outsourcing systems and uh, the credit bureaus are solution partners and vendors, um, our integration partners. So, um, you know, we've actually proven out in the U.S. market um, as the tool that solves for the problem today in a compliant way. Um, in Europe, and we have not expanded outside of the U.S. yet, but we've built for a system that is expandable. In Europe, our system can function without storing any data and all of the, the information we use is consented, and we are bound by the GDPR. We satisfy the GDPR regulations. So, you know, we could operate in, in Europe too, and at, at some point in our future growth, we will. So, you know, a, a question about, um, that I have in listening to this is, is who has access to this identifier, and, and how portable is it? So, so if I think about all this, circumstances where individuals have to authenticate themselves. Um, if there is uh, this, this identity that has been uh, validated, verified um, for, in this case, account openings, is it, is it an easy 
path to thinking about this identifier for other use cases for commerce and just other situations where you have to identify yourself for other reasons? So the short answer is yes. In fact, I stated earlier that new account openings is the most common use case. We use post account opening and non-monetary changes, which might indicate an account takeover attack vector. Someone went in and changed the, uh, the address, for example. We're, we're used in uh, uh, other use cases as well, um, um, in, including um, uh, kind of uh, transaction time use cases. So the remittance industry is an example. When you're moving money or making a payment, um, the sum total information about the, the sender and the recipient should be brought together for the best outcomes. So we're not just simply reserved for use at new account opening. We're used throughout the, the life cycle um, of the account. Sorry if I wasn't clear about that. Got it. Okay. Um, well, this is, I mean, this has been interesting feedback so far on ADA. Thank you. Um, we're the first uh, company to uh, bring an, you know, uh, artificially intelligent uh, identity agent into the, into the market. Um, the agent sits at the intersection for us uh, of security and authentication, uh, you know, providing identity binding for multi-factor authentication, which is always important, otherwise you can't trust biometrics by itself. Um, we are, we sit at the intersection of risk management, uh, preventing fraud, regulatory technology, making sure you're anti-money laundering and KYC compliant, and we put trust in identity. You know, one other part of your question earlier, uh, Karen, about um, kind of uh, single sign-on of identity. Uh, in 1999, I was part of a company that created the notion of single sign-on. And one of the lessons we learned then was that we didn't need one identity to bind them all. And we went on mm -hmm. to create a standard called SAML, Secure Assertion Markup Language, that company did. That has about 40% penetration in global enterprises today, the Fortune 1000s. Um, and so, you know, SAML um, allows you to do identity federation uh, as well as attribute federation for authentication and authorization purposes. Uh, and then you got ADFS on the back of that, Active Directory Federation Services that IBM and Microsoft started. And then on the internet domain, you have OpenAuth 2.0 and OpenID yeah. Connect, um, all of which take care of federating identity in a reusable manner with a token. And we just fit into that because what's missing is trust in the identity and we are right. putting trust in the identity. Excellent. Well, this, is, uh, this has been a fascinating conversation judging by the, all the questions that came in as you, were, as you were going through it. I think I got to every question. Um, if not, uh, we'll review them and make sure that in the write-up we do address um, any questions that we didn't uh, get to in one, in one way or another. Sunil, again, thanks for um, sharing the, the, the context around um, ADA and the importance of getting robots to do something that, to your point, um, humans can't possibly do given all the data that needs to be assimilated and then, and then learned and, and analyzed in order to make um, good trusted decisions about identity. Thanks, thanks so much. Thanks so much, Karen.